What's the word, y'all? Three game slate in the association. Let me give you the clip notes version before we dive into all three of these. The Atlanta Hawks get eliminated in five, man. Wow. Were you surprised? You shouldn't have been because the Atlanta Hawks have played like an eight seed the entire season. So you shouldn't have thought that they were going to be able to take out the one seed. But even with that said, they, they are definitely bogus for losing this game specifically because no Jimmy Butler and no Kyle Lowry. And, and Trey Young had like the worst playoff series that you can imagine. Again, we're going to dive deeper into this. So they bogus. Shout out to DeAndre Hunter for even making this a game. But even though DeAndre Hunter made it the game this wasn't the game the, the Miami Heat had this convincingly for 99.9% .9 of it all right so shout out to the Heat this is the this is the best version of Victor Oladipo since all the injuries and that could be scary for the Eastern Conference we will dive deep into the Atlanta Hawks and the Miami Heat advance to the next round in a second game number two and I guess this is my own personal order the Phoenix Suns uh win a must win at home where Chris Paul has a huge bounce back game from game number four. We put up like four to six points. Mikael Bridges plays almost every second of this game and puts up 30. The real MVP over there. Hope Brandon Ingram is okay. He like jammed his finger or something on his shooting hand. And that's not the greatest, but I hope he is okay. And lastly, uh, the Memphis Grizzlies steal one from the Minnesota Timbos when they were down by like 10 with like six, seven, eight minutes left uh, at home. They steal one to give them a three to lead. And now the Suns and the Grizzlies only need one more win to advance to the second round. That's the Clip Notes version. Let's get into the deep dives. I'm going to start off with this Minnesota Memphis game. I, I've never seen a series, and I've been watching basketball for a long time. Maybe not as long as some of the people watch this video, but a long time. I've never had a series that was equally fun and frustrating. That's what this series has been. Let me explain. Actually, I don't need to explain to you why it's fun. You've been watching the series. You get a John Moran poster, a John Moran game winner. We get play after play after play where it seems like very good coaching. Chris Finch calls timeout. Charles is a beautiful play it draws up a beautiful play to get Anthony Howard to open corner shot shout out to Jordan McLaughlin throwing that pass and boom a three-point shot great shot Carnegie Towns had a huge bounce back game had a lot of people criticizing him he put up a third and even tonight he had a really good game uh, John has been doing his thing Desmond Bain is having breakout performances this has been undoubtedly a fun series because it's been so back and forth but it's been frustrating because you can see the age of this team every second possession if you did not know these are two of the four youngest teams of all of basketball one of their average age is 24.9 and one is 24 exactly I don't know which one is which but they're two of the four youngest teams in the NBA let me let me give you some examples of some some boneheaded frustrated plays for the last game game number four the Memphis Grizz are down by four points and on the call Richard Jefferson are telling them or telling the Minnesota Timberwolves don't even play defense it's three seconds left in the game the only thing to make this a game is if you foul a three-point shooter and he hits the shot Desmond Bain shoots a three that's five feet behind the line and Anthony Edwards is contesting it why why even put yourself in a predicament to almost foul he didn't foul Luckily, bonehead play. Bonehead play number two is actually, it's not even a singular play. This man, Jaron, has been the second most frustrating player for me this whole playoffs. Number one is Trey Young because Trey Young, come on, bro, you're all NBA player. What the hell are we doing by averaging whatever you average? We're going to talk about that, but like, that's number one frustrating player to watch in this playoff run so far. Jaron is, is number two. We talked about last time, bro, was averaging 23 minutes per game. Today, he played 17 and a half minutes. All defensive Jaron, probably. I mean, a ballot's already out, but he was all defensive on my list and you ain't no use for your team on the bench i mean yo the three extra claps you give it sure but you are no use to your team on the bench and bro cannot stop fouling was the last foul he got number six questionable sure but the entire oh y'all know i hate talking about officiating but the entire officiating for this game was trash so i mean like he has to be better. Even if they get out of this round, if you want to have any chance of doing anything in the next round against the Warriors or any chance of doing anything against anybody else, you have to stop fouling. And we've seen this amongst like good big man defenders when they're young. We saw this with Robert Williams like last year and the year before that. A lot of people saw the, the two main things about Robert Williams' game is that, A, he, can't, he cannot stay healthy and he cannot stay on the floor. And this season, he got a lot better on the second half. He still struggled with injuries here and there, but uh, he, he got better with not fouling and now he's an all defensive player. Jaron is still an all defensive player in my eyes, even when he's fouling. But in the playoff series, playing 17 minutes is unacceptable. He played the same amount of minutes as Kyle Anderson. He's supposed to be the second best player. You know? Bonehead. We talked about Anthony Edwards hitting the huge shot. The, the, the biggest shot of his career until this point, right? Uh, we talked about him taking that big shot and hitting that big shot. And then on the other possession, on the other side, defensively, he gambles for the steal that leads to a John ja Morant layup for games. It's bonehead play after bonehead play. But it's still fun. And I'm still, I'm still enjoying it. Now, I don't want to talk about these type of things. If you've been watching this channel for a long time, you know that there's one portion of the game of basketball that I absolutely hate talking about. And I know it's a big portion because everybody talks about it. Everybody on Twitter and, and Reddit like, oh, if it wasn't for this one part of the game, my team would have won. And that's officiating. So you know, if if I am talking about officiating, things went kind of south. And listen, I, I'm not saying, but I'm saying that fourth quarter officiating was god awful. I'll leave it at that. Fourth quarter officiating 
It's god awful. John Moran was having a terrible game until the fourth quarter. Got some whistles. He definitely got some whistles. But he also had to hit the big shots. He had to hit the three that he hadn't hit all ser series long. He had to hit the shots. They had to get the stops, and they did those things. So um, they got they won the rebounding battle. They got they killed the Timberwolves on the glass, on the offensive glass, and that led to second chance points. And all of those things matter, man. All of those things matter, even with the questionable officiating. Now they go back to Minnesota for a game six, and I think it's a coin flip on who gonna win that. Obviously, Minnesota has the um, advantage because I'm guessing there's going to be somebody protesting the game there so that's a plus three to everybody's morale and abilities to shoot the ball but other than that I think it's I think it's a toss-up man I think both of these teams have played each other well it's just different on any given night the Atlanta Hawks got eliminated in five again like I said not a surprise that they got eliminated in five uh I, I didn't see enough of this team for me to even think that they had a chance to maybe pull off an upset like people believe that there's a chance that the that the Brooklyn Nets could pull off an upset I don't think anybody was picking the Atlanta Hawks to beat the Miami Heat unless you were still on a honeymoon from last season's run which would have been crazy because this team doesn't didn't look anything like that I know they went on a nice little run on like the last month and a half two months of the season but even then this team did not look nothing like that John Collins was dreadful and, I, and he's still fighting this injury I guess I commend him for playing but I, I guess I mean not really you didn't contribute positively for the entire team Trey Young got absolutely clamped up the entire series I got the stats and they aren't pretty Trey Young ended the series with 30 turnovers and 22 made field goals he was seven for 38 from three and he had 30 assists he was being hunted on defense and was held to single digits two times in five, a five-game series. Dreadful. And well, 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 a lot of people are not enjoying this run, which makes sense, man. This was this was extremely bad. Again, even though we didn't expect them to win the series, we didn't expect an all-NBA player to put up the numbers that he did, where two of these games, Kevin Knox outscored him in like nine total minutes of basketball. And as much as we could talk about the downfall of the Atlanta Hawks, I'm going to take the time to talk about the greatness that is the Miami Heat. Like I said, Kyle Lowry got injured in the last game. He, he didn't play, or two games ago, and he didn't play this one. And it was basically a late scratch for Jimmy Butler. I mean, I guess he got some time to like get healthy for the next series, whatever. Uh, but two players that are super important, the point guard and the literal star player who have been killing the entire series are out of this. This is a this is a time for the Atlanta Hawks to be able to steal a game, but they couldn't because Victor Oladipo, who had been sitting on ice for 97% of the season, came in today and looked about as close to the all-star version of himself as I've ever seen. And I am not exaggerating. I don't know if we're going to get this version of Victor Oladipo for the rest of their playoff run, but tonight, he looked like he was back in Indy. And if we're getting like 70, 80% of that, that could be extremely, and I mean extremely dangerous for whoever they see in the second round and if they get out of that whoever they see in the conference finals because vo was him today and bam who, who i talked about earlier in the season of not being aggressive and just just looking like he didn't want to not that he didn't want to hoop because he was still very good defensively but he didn't want to play the offensive side of the ball with no jimmy no cal Lowry. hey who's the next guy who's our next all-star caliber player it's bam and he gave you a good offensive performance on top of the great defense and with a 20 point game 11 uh rebounds including some offensive and four assists great performance from him but my mvp over all of this was pj tucker because for for at least four of these five games pj tucker had trey young and alcatraz now i know it's a team effort to guard a guy like Trey Young but the main focus of of defense was PJ Tucker and I know he's not a dude that's gonna score more than at the most nine points but that defense on Trey Young was legendary they gave him fits things that he he said himself in his post game interview things that he ain't seen since he was in high school they did that Spolstra PJ um, Gabe Vincent got a lot of minutes on Trey Young they neutralized an all NBA player who basically just led the league in total points and total assists had him have more turnovers then field goals made. Insanity. And what's next for the Atlanta Hawks is up in the air, in my personal opinion, man. Because if I were them, I'd be calling every team to figure out the values of, of anybody not named DeAndre Hunter and Trey Young. John Collins, even though he's a good player, Again, he was stinky in the series, but I do believe a lot of that had to do with him coming back from his injury. Him and Trey Young haven't jailed completely. I know they went on that run, and his defense was good during that run, but overall, they haven't jailed completely. He's still like 24 years old. Clint Capella has lost a step on both sides of the floor. Kevin Herter is hit or miss, um, but I would still pick up the phone and ask around. Bogdanovich, I think he's got one more year on his contract. I picked up the phone and asked around. If this team doesn't look dramatically different next season, I'd be disappointed. And Travis Slank, who's, who's done a solid job, but to this point, I'd be disappointed pointed if he didn't make some 
some decent a decent amount of moves. And I've been seeing a lot of people uh, talk about a center. Atlanta fans, you might not like to hear this because uh, um, the idea about this player has gone very, very south in the last two seasons. Talk about Clint Cap uh, not Clint Capella. Uh, Rudy Gobert is a center for Trey Young. I'm not saying it's the right move. I'm not saying it's the wrong move. But those are the type of things you should be thinking about. That's all. And lastly, let's talk about this Phoenix Suns game. Unfortunately, I only got to watch the fourth quarter. And in that fourth quarter, I saw a lot of great defense from Mikael Bridges. I saw a lot of great offense from Mikael Bridges. I saw him cutting back door. I saw him hitting shots. If you remember the last time I talked about the series, I talked. I said that there's no way that Mikael Bridges, Jay Crowder, Cameron Johnson, and Landry Shammy continue to shoot like 7% from three together. And though Jay Crowder still was one for five, Mikael went four for four. Cameron Payne in his 11 minutes ended up with uh, two threes and bro fouled out. He was all over the place hacking. But he gave y'all his best performance in the playoffs so far, and that's a good sign. Landry Shammy even hit a three. I knew that the shooting was going to come around eventually, and it was enough for them to get this win. Like I said, Chris Paul came out a little bit more of a vengeance. He did get caught again with the eight second violation because Jose Alvarado is still super exciting and, and uh, a nuisance out there. But one thing I'm super concerned about for the Pelicans' sake is, is Brandon Ingram because, of course, like I said, he hurt his finger in this one, and hopefully it's just a jam and it's okay in a couple days. Because I, but I know a jam finger on the shooting hand can be tough. It can be super tough. CJ? Last two performances, not the greatest. And they need him to be great if they want to win this series. That's all. But yeah, man, one more game for Memphis and one more game for uh, Phoenix. But anything is still possible. They still have to go into uh, the opposing team's territory to make a make a win. Unless we're going to game seven. I want to see at least one game seven in the first round. Is that too much to ask for? At least one game seven with the stakes are at an all-time high. There's nothing better than a, a game seven in the NBA. You feel me? I guess a game seven or elimination game anywhere, whether it be college, whether it be in the NFL, one game eliminations, or in the wild card game in the MLB. One game elimination is peak sports, peak fandom, and I need those.